must say I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. Unfortunately, I'm not quite as intelligent as your physiologist. That's why I'm a clinician, but I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit about the um, clinical outcome of all of this. Now, my conflict of interest is I don't have a financial conflict of interest. I do have various academic conflicts of interest. And what I'm going to talk about is what's the meaning of evidence in the clinical setting. And we do have some lessons learned from critical care and the state of the evidence and uh, what I consider are the open questions. Now, um, when we say evidence, what we mean in the, context, in the context of drugs and fluids are drugs is that the first type of evidence happens here in the preclinical phase. We look at laboratory and animal studies, we, uh, we prove the biological activity, we have a concept of why it should work and we show it works and we assess safety and only then do we progress to the various phases with increasing numbers of uh, subjects uh, and thousands of patients and volunteers or volunteers in that phase. Now, this has not, this is only true uh, for drugs that were uh, developed after the legislation came into practice. So when, when we look at our IV fluids, they all entered the market well before. The, you, you hope we know all this, uh, and this you all know, and gamma acacia, I'm happy to hear that it's not forgotten here. We have others, other stuff, and these are the three fluids that are still in use, the synthetic colloids, and they stem from way back. And all new uh, fluids, like the new starches, the modern starches, and so on, they were just added on top of the, this approval so fluids which are used today are basically unevaluated drugs and the clinical practice is developed for historical reasons, not based on clinical evidence. So I'm also showing a picture of William Bayless because I was uh, researching, I was trying to find out where this colloid paradigm, this number 4 to 1 or this notion came from and, and I ended with William Bayless and this paper, and this is what I consider is the colloid paradigm. The effect, and he means gum acacia, its effect is due to the fact that the blood vessels are impermeable to colloids, so that their osmotic pressure is effective in retaining within the circulation the solution that has been injected, a property which salts do not possess, since the vessels are permeable to them. Uh, this is what we would call the colloid paradigm and the efficacy of, of, of colloids was measured by the raising of blood pressure. This is a picture from the cat, but we've seen much better pictures before. Um, this is actually a precursor of starches. It's another German product, polyvinyl pyrrolidone. It was developed in the Second World War and it came in a number of different modifications. It was given to about half a million soldiers in the Second World War in a kind of a human experiment. It's very, it's practically not degradable. It leads to foam cell formation, osmotic nephrosis. It was then withdrawn in the US formally. And now and then still patients come up which, uh, who have been given PVP in other countries. And you can see these types of this is a pathologic fracture of the arm bone, the humerus, because it was the, the, the PVP had uh, been deposited here and formed these kinds of lesions. So we, we under a Freedom of Information Act, uh, we looked at the uh, approval data for starches in 1972 uh, by the FDA. And you can see it is called uh, adequate and well controlled, but this is according to the thinking of the 1970s. This means about 200 uh, patients given one, two or three bags of uh, starches and it's absolutely not controlled by a comparative fluid. And for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, this is a sepsis patient who received starches 
and uh, she was given 500 mils. The blood pressure rose. Safety and efficacy are documented. So similar thing you can see here in trauma and hemorrhage patients. They were given starches. The blood pressure rose. Safety and efficacy are documented. That's the kind of evidence we are dealing with in the 70s. There was some. There were some uh, animal uh, studies, which uh, showed vacuole formation of the liver cells, fatty macrophages and lymph nodes, spleen, and so on. Uh, lipid droplets in the kidney proximal tubular cells. We would now call osmotic nephrosis, and we also saw excessive. Uh, they also saw excessive splenic to body weight ratio hyper. Uh, um, splenomegaly, but it was just not followed up. It was not considered relevant. It disappeared. And um, as I said, you might believe from the uh, approval of tetrastarch in 2007 that this had been an evaluated drug. It wasn't. It was just added onto this. So we not only have eminent physiologists, we also have eminent uh, detectives in London. So what do we do when we have a lot of evidence grown over the years, uh, very diffuse, we don't know where is the good evidence. Uh, Sherlock Holmes recommended to, the grand thing is to be able to reason backwards. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to reason backward. Uh, we uh, have now three large uh, critical care studies that are land scale trials. Uh, you can see here, these are the acronyms, CHESS, 6S, VICEP, these are the years in which they were performed, and these are the patients they were performed in. And they consistently uh, uh, reported damage to the kidney, increased renal replacement therapy, uh, problems with bleeding, increased use of blood products, or numbers of patients who needed uh, red blood cell transfusion, pruritus, and 90-day mortality was increased in the sepsis patients. And look here, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. It goes up to 90 days. But in the sepsis patients, if the trial had been stopped at 28 days, you would not have picked up the signal of increased mortality. So it was important to go on with the follow-up. And this is my message. These trials were able to pick up the signals because they had large numbers of patients, they had an adequate control fluid, they had a patient relevant endpoint, and they had a follow up which was adequately, which was long enough. Um, and these trials do not exist in the perioperative setting. We've already heard about this. The what's the efficacy of colloids compared to crystalloids, and um, these are heart rate, um, uh, mean arterial pressure, lactate levels, CVP. This is data from the SAFE, uh, from the uh, CHESS trial from the Australians with 7,000 intensive care patients. And the only thing that differs a little bit is uh, one measurement of CVP right in the beginning. So whatever efficacy there is, whatever effect there is, it's not really highly relevant. And I was very pleased to hear uh, our speakers before me talk about this. Um, when we look in the textbooks, uh, we learn, and I learned this as a resident, that we need to give at least four times as much crystalloids as uh, colloids to replace losses. But when we look at the clinical trials, this is absolutely not true. These are children with dengue fever shock. These are intensive care patients, 7,000 intensive care patients. These are sepsis patients. These are trauma patients from the first trial from Michael James. And um, this is, again, a sepsis trial. So it, it's a little bit more than one-to-one -one maybe, but definitely not four-to-one or even more. Uh, I've, I've, this is a redundant slide. You've seen much better before, but for clinicians, and w when I when I saw this, it was, I thought it was very, um, uh, it, 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 it showed the problem very well. This actually is an accidental finding by a Japanese group. 
they wanted to measure the crystalloid to colloid effect by measuring how much of the uh, uh, fluorescence marked starches was inside the vessel and how much left the vessel, but they couldn't because immediately the whole surrounding was green. It, everything leaked out into the surrounding tissues and they weren't able to measure anything. They were quite disappointed, but this is what you would see in, in a rat uh, which is uh, kind of held under the microscope and slit a little bit. Um, and uh, this is old data which I like very much from uh, uh, Moore, a US surgeon uh, who uh, bled volunteers to lose 600 milliliters of blood and he measured albumin and he measured the extracellular volume, plasma volume Again, a redundant picture, but I believe for clinicians quite valuable to see that everything shifts back. Uh, everything sort of goes back to normal within a few hours by a fluid ex by a fluid shift, which is accompanied with albumin. Of course, it, otherwise it wouldn't work. And the same thing is when you infuse two liters of, of crystalloids, then it equilibri equi equilibrates back uh, over both of these compartments. So. For the clinician, I think this is very um, a very good way to look at it. Now, the, the starch toxicity, I showed you the kidney damage, the uptake, the storage, the coagulation, and the prolonged bleeding. Uh, I find it hard to believe, but actually, when you look in the literature, this has been known since the 1970s. It's not new, but it took the large-scale clinical trials to recognize the relevance for the patients and to act on it. Uh, so eventually the um, regulatory agencies, the European medicines agencies, um, acted on request of the German uh, body. And I'm showing you this because the UK had a decisive part in the outcome. This is uh, what we also wrote in the, in the British Medical Journal. Uh, the first procedure that was triggered and that started was a so-called Article 1 procedure and uh, there's, a, there's a committee, the so-called PRAC, Pharmacovigilance Assessment Committee or something like that, headed by two uh, uh, leaders of this committee and they arrived at the decision to suspend starches altogether. When UK heard this, or actually what then happened was that the firms, the producers of starches, requested a reassessment of the data, which is their right. And when UK heard this, your Department of Health said, now we won't wait until this has filtered through all the various European levels and becomes the law. We know enough. We'll withdraw starches immediately. And you acted upon uh, your medical societies and I think this was a great thing to do I really must applaud you and I think this was just wonderful um, but it was unfortunate in a setting like the European Union because this kind of unilateral action triggered a separate review which was called an urgent action review uh, you just went out of line which you shouldn't have and there was a second PRAC committee with a second uh, completely different uh, leaders uh, and uh, they arrived at, different, at a different uh, recommendation. They said, well, it should be not, no longer be used in ICU and sepsis and burns and so on, but it may still be used uh, in the setting of hypovolemia due to acute blood loss when crystalloids alone are not considered sufficient. And this then eventually was made a binding decision. So why did the second committee arrive at a different uh, decision or a different recommendation? Uh, they claimed this was based on new data, and I'm going to show you the new data very quickly. The first study is the so-called CRYSTAL study, 2,800 ICU patients randomized to receive any colloid or any crystalloid, no matter what, as long as it was a crystalloid or a colloid. Uh, the 28-day mortality tended and the 90-day mortality worse 
different in favor of color. It's the first uh, study to show a difference in favor of colloid. But uh, single fluid comparisons like starches versus any other are post-randomization subgroups. So should, event, uh, should be treated as observational data. And the other two, this is an uh, unpublished trial in sepsis patient and the other is an unpublished ICU registry. So we have two two studies on ICU patients and one in sepsis patients informing and changing a recommendation for surgical or trauma patients. This doesn't make sense and this BMG article has already been alluded to. So what is the evidence in surgical and trauma patients on synthetic colloids? As I said, we don't have the large-scale uh, studies. We do have a meta-analysis by one of the author um, uh, presenters here uh, post-operative death and acute kidney injury. They looked at hospital mortality and said given the absence of demonstrable benefit we are unable to recommend the use of starches in surgical patients. There's also uh, a review which wants to make us believe that there might be a reduction of mortality but it's selective and I've taken the liberty to add uh, the two studies that had longer follow-ups. This is a small, you see, 50 patient surgical study from Berlin uh, which looked at 90-day mortality and this is the trauma study from the James Group from South Africa uh, who looked at the mortality data after 30 days and everything shifts back to the middle. The data is simply inconclusive because we don't have the numbers that we need. Meta-analysis on bleeding also show that uh, in comparison to albumin, starches lead to a higher blood loss in cardiopulmonary bypass surgery. And this is a recent meta-analysis on renal replacement therapy in surgical therapy in surgical patients. And this is driven by a subgroup from the CHESS trial the 7,000 ICU uh, trial, uh, here you have 3,000 uh, surgical patients from this study and you see that there's a significant increase of renal replacement therapy after starches. Now when we don't have good randomized control trials, we turn to look at observational trials. This is a really nice um, analysis from the Cleveland Clinic. They looked at 40,000 adults who received a surgery, and this is a propensity matched comparison in about 30,000 patients comparing those who received colloids with those who did not. And you can see how the rate of acute kidney injury goes up with the administered dose, and this is the most severe um, uh, stage of acute kidney injury, end stage kidney failure or need for renal replacement therapy. We also uh, looked at our own patients uh, in cardiac surgery, over 6,000 consecutive patients from three fluid periods, starches, gelatins, because we thought we could not do without colloids, and then only crystalloids. And we found that the, uh, ri uh, the risk for acute kidney injury was increased in the starch period but also in the gelatin period and the uh, occurrence of renal replacement therapy was higher in both uh, in, in both synthetic colloid treatment groups and this is a, an analysis adjusted by two different adjustment um, methods and by the way we also could not see any remarkable effect of the colloids uh, on any of these central venous oxygenation, CVP, lactate, or vasopressor use. So the question here is, and because you in Britain still use a lot of gelatin, uh, clinicians say, so if we can't use starches and we need some kind of college, shouldn't we be able to use gelatin? Now, it's quite clear that gelatins have a similar risk profile as starches or incidentally as dextrans. All the synthetic colloids have similar risks 
and gelatin has been withdrawn by the FDA in the U.S. because of increased bleeding in 1978. It, it is stored up to 30 percent outside the vasculature, like in a, in a similar amount, in a, in a similar degree like, like starches or dextrans. And there is very, very poor evidence, uh, clinical evidence from trials on the safety of gelatin uh, most importantly, the studies were not designed to assess harm, and there's no survival benefit. I'm just showing you a picture of a gelatin nephrosis from post-mortem exams in surgical cancer patients. And this is what the clot look, looks like when you dilute with gelatin. This is saline, a clot with saline, and this is a clot uh, after gelatin dilution. Uh, the fibrin network is rarefied, you get a very, uh, very weak and easily dissolvable clot, same as with starches and dextrans. And there are uh, some, there's some animal data from different groups, I'm just showing you this one, which shows that gelatin is actually quite deleterious, mortality is increased, and the kidney damage here, the injury score after gelatin is even higher than that after starches and definitely higher than that after uh, crystalloids. So the uh, NHS, the NICE, uh, has been uh, saying for some time colloids should not be used routinely. Uh, this is, uh, they refer to data from the Cochrane uh, collaboration. They have been over the years saying again and again colloids are not associated with an improvement in survival and so on. It's hard to see how their continued use can be justified. So just to make it quite clear, synthetic colloids are potentially harmful. Benefit hasn't been shown and there's no reason to expect a different action outside the ICU in surgical or trauma patients. Often these patients also receive treatment in the ICU and why should starches as uh, colloids act different in, uh, differently in those patients? So in the interest of patient safety, they should be avoided altogether. So I very quickly go through other open questions. Is saline harmful? Is less fluid better? And it's quick because we don't have clinical data. Uh, saline, uh, we know, is still the most widely used fluid, also in the UK. It's called unbalanced because of a higher sodium and chloride content. It may lead to hypochloremic metabolic acidosis, but it's unclear whether this is harmful for the patient. Observational data points to renal failure. We do have a recent network analysis which kind of uh, um, triangulated from other trials with different comparisons that the balanced crystalloid versus saline comparison for which there is no direct comparison uh, may show, may tend to increase mortality. But we'll only know if we have the good clinical trials with the criteria I pointed out before. And I'm happy to say that the Scandinavian's critical care trials group uh, led by Anders Perna is currently undertaking such a trial. So in in uh, sometime we'll, we'll be able to, to get a definite answer on that. Wet versus dry, uh, liberal versus restrictive fluids has been a topic that's been coming up. This is a meta-analysis showing that in trauma, this is all we have, three, three small trials. The mortality benefit here, these are trials that investigated <coughs> delayed resuscitation, waiting until patients come into the OR. They then have a lower blood pressure. This is called hypotensive resuscitation. This um, is good to keep or to stop the bleeding. Uh, one can understand that this, is, this may be uh, beneficial, but this is all we have. We can't really say anything. And in surgery, these are the trials that we have here. So you might deduce from these meta-analyses that wet or, or being more conservative would be better, but I want to caution you, 
There's data from the ARDS network. You know, there was a very complicated trial with a sophisticated algorithm in ARDS patients published in 2006, where more patients were breathing without assistance when they got less fluid within this algorithm. But looking up, looking, uh, uh, following up patients, following up the survivors, the increased impairment of cognitive function is uh, much higher in the group who got the conservative fluid strategy. Now this is uh, a big attrition bias, uh, small numbers, but one must be very careful and again to get answers here we need high quality clinical trials. Now. For the colleague who pointed, who asked the question about SAFE, I just quickly included some slides on albumin. From the SAFE trial with the 7,000 uh, ICU patients, albumin versus normal saline, there were two subgroups. One was the subgroup in trauma, which found uh, that patients did less well, more died when they received albumin. This was due to brain injury. And there was a subgroup with severe sepsis patients indicating hypothesis generating that albumin might be beneficial in sepsis. So two studies have been finished now investigating albumin in sepsis. This is a French one, it's only the abstract has been presented so far. There's no, no effect by increasing the albumin levels by adding 20% of albumin. And this is the Adios trial. Uh, from Luciano Gattinoni in uh, published this year, you see full marks on my kind of list of good endpoints and good good design. Uh, but as you can see, no significant signal. Uh, looking again at subgroups, there's a benefit in the subgroup with uh, septic shock. So there's people who say, that maybe you can use it when you have no more option left in septic shock, but um, actually no benefit has really been proven in sepsis. This is my last slide. You've seen this before. I want to make the point, can new trials show benefit of fluids? So. I want to make the point that we need to consider this phase. This has been kind of is non-existent due to historical reasons and maybe we should think about, go back to the drawing board, think about testing biological um, activity in models before we turn to the human experiment. Thank you.